sort of um, uh, you've done some sort of a, um, a, a Facebook campaign that's just bubbled under and caught people's imagination. You've tweeted and caught people's imagination. You've done an email campaign that has caught people's uh, imagination. Um, you know, you, 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 well, you, you can't sit there and hope that they're going to come and see your play. You've got to sit there and plan your campaign. And the, the result of the campaign, the coup de grace, is when Maureen, Maureen Hughes walks in there and she sees your, your play. And she says, I liked that play and I want your information. And you give me the information and I put it on file. You're the woman who was in the play that you invited me to, I went to. And then the dots start adding up. Sometimes they don't. Um, more often than not, uh, uh, the actor is negative. Um, you know, oh, the audience were dreadful. Uh, or it's not my responsibility or my fault as an actor. Often, if, if you haven't stacked your argument up, if you haven't worked your campaign from beginning right through to first night, right through to last night, there's a terrible danger that you'll blame other people for that. If you don't get bums on seats, then you have no friends. You know, if you need a hundred people at 20 euro, you can find them. And if you can't find them, find half of them and go, go, go to your local centre and ask them to give you a 50 euro sponsorship. Or get loads of stuff together and run a raffle. You know, it's, it's, it's very possible, even in these times where, where we're being told the world is over and, and all these things are happening, it's very possible to give up and not do that. Uh, I'd argue that this is the very time, the very point that you need to, we need to get up off our backsides and make work that challenges, interrogates, entertains, enlivens and gives a kind of a, um, it gives a view of what we're at that, that is important. That comes right back down to our friend the fire in your, in your belly. Um, you, you, you've got to talk to agents, there's no doubt about that. Now don't believe for a moment that the agent has all the answers. I could list ten actors who are with agents who get no work. I could list another 10 actors who are with agents and they get their own work, but the agent doesn't do anything. And I could list 10 actors whose agents are really working hard for them. Remember the challenge that we're all in is that because there's so many actors going out there uh, and there's only the same, pretty much the same amount of agents, you know, it's, it, it's a, there's a danger of it spreading thin, which is why you've got the co-op agencies, the castaways, the reactors coming on the scene and providing a really top class service because it's owned by the people who are doing it, it's a co-op, uh, and providing a very top class service there. And that's a very different experience for an actor because, you know, they're having to work on the phones and they're going to have to add up the numbers and they're going to have to make it all work. But, but reactors and, and st um, reactors and um, castaway, and there's other kind of co-op agencies, and there will be others. Um, somebody said to me the other day, well, well sh should, we, should, we, should we set up one of our own? And, and you know, if, if you need to set up an agency of your own, make sure you're able to stack it all up so that you know who's out, who the casting directors are. You, you have an idea of, of what the industry is like. Um, and if you do know all of that, then, then, then take a chance on it. Um, there's the Lisa Richards agency, there's, the, there's a whole pile of agencies out, out there and the average, the normal response is, I'm sorry but our books are full. And if their books are full, that's what they are, they're full. Um, that does not stop you doing what I said earlier of doing a show, but because I tell you, if the books are full and you walk in with the talent that you have in that play, I'll take you on. I don't care about the books being full. All I want is talent. That's all I want if I'm an agent. I want talent, talent, talent. I don't want... So I may tell you my books are full, but, but if you... I mean, year after year, uh, the actors of this program, the, the, the two-year intensive full-time program here at this school, um, are told that the books are full. And every year, people are taken on. People are taken on because they're, they've been seen in showcases, they've been seen in graduation plays, they've been sh seen in short films, they've been seen in all that stuff. And that's, that's where, where an agent jumps, you know. Um, somebody was asking last night about whether, whether uh, a showreel, you know, how valuable is a showreel? A showreel is hugely valuable. If, if, I mean, there's two types of showreel. There's showreel one, which is actually excerpts from films that you've done, short films that you've done, or excerpts from, are we doing, how are we doing? We're doing fine. Excerpts from... Um, commercials that you've made, or excerpts from um, pieces that you, you, if you can put them all together, stuff that's been professionally made, you can edit it down into a very tight little showreel which can go to your casting directors or your agents, and that's, that's a way of whetting their appetite. 
If you haven't been in anything, um, that's fine as well. You can still go to, and there's a lot of cowboys out there, but you can still go to somebody and say, I want to make a showreel. And they'll say, okay, let's talk about what, what do you want to do. Well, I want to, I want to put a piece of one monologue in there, and I want to put a piece of another monologue in there, and I want to do two scenes, um, two scenes, you know, two-person scenes, and I want to do uh, a piece of a song. You know, you need, to, you need to shoot the footage, and then you need to get them to edit the footage into something that is a package that is deliverable. And I've seen showreels that people have made that have been absolutely fantastic. And they've never made a movie in their lives. They've never been in a, you know, they've never done any of that stuff. But they've created and fashioned something themselves that has exactly the same, exactly the same impact. You need to know that an agent who's busy, busy, busy and gets this disc in or gets it on email and, and look, looks it up has got remarkably little time. You, you're either going to catch their attention in the five, four, three, the five or six seconds, or you may have missed it, disc out, you know, onto the next email. That's the world we're all living in, unfortunately. People are giving each other so little time, um, so little time, and I think that's a shame. That's why, uh, yeah, that's why when you do get a conversation with Gary Hines, you might get work there, but you've had a conversation with her and you've got, uh, you've got an idea that next year or the year after she's doing the sing cycle again and that you really want to play one of the girls in whatever it is, you know, so, so, so map, your, map your path there. Um, uh, I was going to, yeah, the, the, the idea of a, of a showreel, you can go to pie hole, you know, you can get, you can get a voice tape made. If, if somebody says to you, you've got a great voice for radio, then you've got to reflect on that. Have I got a great voice for radio? Well, he said I have. Have I got a great voice for radio? You've got, if, if, if radio is, I mean, there's a lot of money in radio commercials. There's a girl called Ema Morrissey who left this program a couple of years ago. <laughs> Ema Morrissey um, does average amount of acting work, but does a huge amount of voiceover work. Masses of voiceover work. Like thousands upon thousands, tens and twenty thousands worth of voiceover work. Um, in, in this town. I mean, she's all over the place. And it's real private, nobody knows about it, but Emer is making a small fortune uh, out of it. And as, as far as, uh, as, far as um, putting yourself out there, you need to know a little more about the industry that you're going into. And uh, I was, Gabriel Byrne was, was here talking to us some, some time ago. And the advice that Gabriel gave, because one of the actors said, what, what is the story uh, between work, you know, Gabriel, between jobs, what do you do? He says, oh, I'm, I'm so hungry to read plays, to read screenplays. I mean, the amount of screenplays that you can download for nothing and read them and interrogate them and reimagine them is phenomenal. You know, there's no reason to be sitting there doing nothing when there are plays to be read, when there are film scripts to be read, when there are plays to go and see, when there are journals to, to, to keep, when there are diaries to write, when there are plays to be written, when there are buddies to talk about, what are we going to do, how are we going to get ourselves through this? You know, when are we going to put that play on? Who are we going to talk to? We're going to talk to those guys at Smock Alley, we're going to talk to Willie, in the, the, we're going to talk to the boys in the, uh, in the new theatre, we're going to talk to Joe Devlin up in, we're going to go to the Granary in Cork and talk to Tony Fay, we're going to go to Galway and see about the Black... All this stuff is there for you to, to take control of. Um, and some of us just aren't hungry enough. Some of us are kind of happy to sit back and just maybe wait for the phone to ring. It ain't going to ring. It just ain't going to ring. And you have a job to make sure that you get them to ring. And that's about putting yourself in the way of it. Putting yourself, absolutely putting yourself in the, in, in the way of it. Um, the biggest fear is fear itself. The biggest fear is I'm afraid that this isn't going to work for me. You know, I have this passion, I have this fire. I'm ready to go, but I just am frightened. You know, you've got to turn that fear into something tangible and usable.